Um, and the one thing I would like you all to know about is if you go to rickandpaulwine.com, I have a radio show that we record at Capital Public Radio with Rick Cushman. He's the wine commentator for Capital <laughs> Public Radio in Sacramento. Let's first make sure the wine's okay, then make sure the person's okay. <laughs> Are we okay? Everybody's okay? Okay. Um, so rickandpaulwine.com, we record a new uh, segment every week. It's an hour-long show, which means it's about 44 minutes long. You gotta love radio. And we talk about wine, we talk about uh, how to serve wine, and one of the things we do without mercy is that we make fun of wine snobs. Okay? So, if there are any in the room, hang on for the ride. What do you know about Argentina? When you think about Argentina, what immediately comes to mind? Malbec, that's because you're wine people. Ask the average American, okay, that's two things that have fallen. <laughs> if we need three things, if anyone would like to volunteer to be the third thing, <laughs> get this out of the way right now, and then we don't have to live in suspense. Thank you. So your wine people, ask the average American about Argentina, and what do they sing? I mean, say? Soccer, you've got Maradona, and you've got the greatest player in the world right now, Leo Messi, and you've got a generation of desperation because they haven't won a trophy. They always come in second. They came in second to the Copa de America. They came in second in the World Cup. Gosh, that must, well, the Bills fans know what that's like. Uh, what else? Soccer and Malbec. Financial issues in the industry across the country, um, and and at one point I visited the National Museum uh, in Buenos Aires, and they have a timeline of democracy in Argentina. Since the nineteen since nineteen World War Two since nineteen forty five, a total of two presidents in Argentina have successfully lost an election and turned it over to somebody else. Everybody else got removed by a coup, got assassinated, left town. Um, it's, an, it's a different take on democracy, although when you think about it, it's pretty clear that some people in America would like to take over that system <laughs> and use it right now. Just get rid of everybody and start from scratch. What else about Argentina? We mentioned the tango. Polo, actually the greatest polo players in the world are Argentine. Skiing in the Andes. Beef. Beef. Beef is big. What was that? Bonarda. Yes, the great uh, local grape of Argentina, one of them. Evita. Right? I said, what do we sing? I mean, say, and nobody burst into Don't Cry For Me, Argentina. Don't we have any Madonna fans in this crowd? <laughs> Too many prima donnas. Well, Evita was a prima donna. Um, so I'm going to give you a quick... It's interesting because if you ask Argentines what they think about themselves, they would not have mentioned many of those things. When you ask Argentines about themselves, one of the first things they would have said is, nobody understands how big we are. And I'm sorry I don't have this image in my slide presentation, but if you laid out a map of Argentina over the United States, Argentina is as long as the United States is wide. Okay? That's a big country. And at its widest, it is almost as wide as the United States is tall, if you can forgive those geographic terms. Um, but it's a little, it tapers out. But it's a huge country. Um, latitude of Buenos Aires. Anyone want to take a city that's basically the same latitude in the United States in the north as Buenos Aires is in the south? New York is a guess. Miami is a better guess. Los Angeles would be a really, really, really good guess. 
Yeah, Miami's a little south. But when you think, uh, and remember Buenos Aires is at the furthest north, so it goes south from there, which in the southern hemisphere means Basically, if you think about Argentina, it runs from San Diego to Alaska. Okay, huge broad range, but the difference is we have fabulous mountains in California. In fact, if you followed the mountains from California up to Alaska, you would run by a number of peaks that go over 14,000 feet high. And in Argentina, they go over 22,000 feet high. So my wife and I have backpacked in Argentina where we went over a pass, a pass, mind you, that was 15,700 feet high. And we were looking up 5,000 feet at the peaks above us. Well, we were doing okay, you know. For old people, we were doing okay at 15,000. <laughs> I am happy to report that the young woman with us who was 24 years old was the one who was having trouble with the altitude. So. <laughs> As we, ha we have an expression amongst backpackers, opka, old people kick ass. <laughs> so where do they grow grapes in Argentina? And we normally say, what's the classic region in Argentina? Mendoza, Mendoza right. We're going to taste a bunch of wines from Mendoza today, but we're also going to taste a wine from a completely different region because just like from San Diego to Alaska, Argentina has a huge spectrum of conditions, and of course, they are in one way very different because all of the weather in the southern hemisphere comes from what direction? Anybody know? Comes from the west. Okay. So the weather blows from west to east, which means it hits the Andes, it dumps catastrophic amounts of snow in the Andes, and on the eastern side, just like in New Zealand, the eastern side is a rain shadow. And so you get these dry areas along the rain shadow of the Andes that protects the vines. Now, they do have their own little problems, but let's take a quick look at, here are some of the wine regions. How many of you have had a wine from Salta? Okay, anybody been to Salta? Anybody know where Salta is? Argentina. Argentina. <laughs> Never raise the bar too high on your students. <clears throat> Northwest corner right up against Bolivia. Okay, It's 10,000 feet, and my dear friend Randall Johnson at Hess grows grapes, and as he points out, grows Pinot Noir at 9,500 feet in Salta. I said, what was that like? And he said, if you can imagine how expensive that would be, I said, yeah. He said, double that. I said, okay. He said, do you got that number in your mind? I said, yeah. He said, now triple it. <laughs> he said, yeah, it was quite an adventure. But uh, elevation, 9,500 feet, the highest vineyards in the world. Um, La Rioja, my favorite answer to this question, we had a conversation about Appalachian recently. And one of the Argentines was asked, how can you in Argentina have a region called La Rioja when you know that in Spain, the most famous wine region in Spain is also La Rioja? And his answer was perfect. We didn't call it La Rioja. The Spanish who got here called it La Rioja. It's their problem, not ours. And then we have San Juan. Um, which many people in America think of as a, a region that grows larger, concent uh, larger volumes of grapes, but we're going to taste a wine from San Juan that's going to knock your socks off today. Uh, and then we have Mendoza, and south of Mendoza, uh, a cooler region up in the foothills of the Andes, up to almost 5,000 feet elevation. So if you can imagine growing grapes on Mount Washington. Um, yeah. That's where they're growing grapes in the Andes, and that's the Valle del Uco, the Uco Valley. Okay? Um, just to clarify, everybody should have a white wine in the glass furthest to the left. I point that out because the gentleman in front of me has a red wine followed by a white wine, and I'm hoping that those first two just got switched on you, sir. Okay. There on the left, you can see a map of Argentina. Um, at the very end, that leads across a relatively narrow strait, about 150 miles 
to Antarctica. So again, as far north as Alaska. And then you can see working their way north, you have um, uh, Rio Negro, you have La Pampa, the huge open plains of the gauchos, right? Argentines would say they're famous for gauchos. Nobody even mentioned gauchos here. Uh, in fact, the most famous gaucho of all, anyone know his name? It is not Gaucho Marx, although you get points for that one. That was good. Okay. That makes up for your friend with the joke about Argentina. There you go. Okay. Uh, no, it's actually, his name is Juan Gil, and he is a legendary folk character in Argentina. And one of his, he consistently plays tricks on travelers. He's a little bit of a, a, a legendary character that way but he is also known to take care of people who live a pure and honest life. And if you go out into the Pampa to trick people or do things wrong, sooner or later Juan Gil will catch up to you. But if you go out pure of heart and mind and if you need help, Juan Gil in one way or another will help you out. So quite a, an interesting character. And then as you go very to the very far north, which of course for us would be closer to the equator, so. It would be as if we were going south here. You have Salta up at 10,000 feet in the Andes. The, um, yes? Sorry, uh, Juan Gil is also a brand marketed by someone out of Spain. Is that their version of revenge for La Rioja? Out of Spain, because I've also seen the wine in Argentina, but it's an Argentine wine. But Juan Gil is an Argentine wine. Okay, I thought part of the Argentine wine. Uh, I th he, has one, he has a wine in Spain called Juan Gil? Okay, good. There is a wine in Argentina also called Juan Gil. I know that because I once tried to get a brand to market that and they said the trademark was already taken in Argentina by a local winery, so yeah. Um, the larger map on your left is Mendoza. This is sort of the center of Argentine wine. And again, as you go north, you get warmer. As you go south, you get cooler. And if you are looking to build wines that have both rich, ripe fruit and freshness and acidity and life, you're probably going to be moving south and east of Mendoza, which is exactly where Valle del Uco is, the, the, the high end, the Napa Valley of Argentina. Okay, questions? Cool. Here's the Uco Valley, the Tunuyan River. Has anyone been to the Uco Valley? Cool, two people. Okay, what do you think? What, what struck you as being different about the Uco Valley compared to the Napa Valley? Uh, it's a much more uh, it's a drier climate. <laughs> yes, it is. It's high desert, it is. It's high desert, and there are not wineries every 300 yards along the highway. In fact, <laughs> you will drive for miles without seeing a winery. Then you'll see a couple of wineries. Then you'll drive for a few more miles. It's just bigger. And I don't mean bigger in terms necessarily of quantity of grapes. I just mean the land is bigger. In the Napa Valley, we look at towering Mount St. Helena, which is 4,000 feet high. Um, in Mendoza, you're at 4,000 feet as you're looking up at the Andes, which are 15,000 feet higher than that. Um, huge, broad swaths of basically desert. The land values in Mendoza, in the Uco Valley, are strictly regulated by one thing, water. You can buy a piece of property absolutely clear and free in Mendoza for about three to $5,000 an acre. It will not have a drop of water on it, and the only thing it is good for is looking at and noticing it has a few cacti. Directly next door, adjacent to that property, you can pay $40,000 an acre because there's water. And the water allows you to grow grapes. Now the water may be a river or it may be an underground stream, but in most cases in Mendoza, these are, these are uh, streams and the streams are flood irrigated into the vineyards. They actually divert the streams to water the vineyards, completely different from anywhere else. And if you ever want to have an amusing conversation with an Argentine, ask him about all the advice the Californians and French gave them about how to grow grapes in Argentina. And they will tell you, oh yes, they gave us wonderful advice. And they've all left and we're still here. <laughs> um, because you can't drip irrigate in Argentina in many cases because the ground is so porous the water just goes right through and the vines do nothing. 
Um, the French are worried about mildew. There is no such thing as mildew in Argentina because there's no water. What they have to worry about is drought, and of course the other thing they have to worry about, which in France is almost non-existent, is hailstorms the size of footballs, um, which is very localized, but you can imagine, quite literally, hailstones the size of your fist will not just kill the grapes on the vine, it will actually kill the vine. Um, so you have this unbelievably powerful natural forces there at play that we really don't see quite so much in our in our polite little northern hemisphere climates. Um, San Juan, it's 150 miles north of Mendoza, so you're getting warmer. Sand in the soil. So now you've gone from, if, if you've ever been to the southwest of the United States, that's a little bit what Mendoza looks like, except instead of plateaus and mesas and the song of the good, the bad, and the ugly ringing through your ears. Wow. Yeah. Instead, you're hearing the flutes of the Incas, and you're hearing Evita sing, Don't Cry For Me, Argentina. But the landscape is sort of similar in that a lot of rock, a lot of granite, and then when you get into San Juan, you actually start getting into what is more typically southwestern desert uh, sand. Uh, very, very interesting place to grow grapes because, again, no water holding capability to, at all in the, in the soil. Average rainfall t in San Juan, anybody see that number up there? Six inches. Does that technically qualify for a desert? Absolutely. Absolutely. Desert's anything under 10 inches a year. Six inches a year, that's, yeah, that's basically a bathtub. So there's San Juan. Look at, look at what is in the background of that vineyard. That's a sand dune, right? Um, but it still cools down at night because they're still growing grapes at 5,000 feet. So the classic conditions for growing grapes, you need enough water to keep the vine alive, you need warm days to ripen the fruit, and you need cool days to make sure the acidity stays in the wine. That's what works, cool nights. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk into the wines, but I'm a little afraid the Chardonnay is getting warm. Chardonnay from the Uco Valley, at the very highest point of the Uco Valley, 5,500 feet above sea level. Taste this wine. It was made by Pepe Galante, the father of Argentine winemaking. He loves Chardonnay. The first time he poured me this Chardonnay, I said, this is one of the greatest Chardonnays I've ever had. He said, from Argentina? I said, no, 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 no. This is one of the greatest Chardonnays I've ever had. We have to send this wine to the American Wine Society because it is a fabulous, fabulous Chardonnay. What do you think? I agree. Wow, huh? Your technical term is yummy. That's absolutely right. <laughs> or to quote Oliver Twist, please, sir, may I have some more? <laughs> it has everything. It has that beautiful, almost tropical character in the nose, in the mouth, perfect mid-palate, almost a little bit... Um, uh, uh, salty or, or in, the, in the finish, there's a little bit of not just fruit. Um, strike me dead, I'm about to say minerality. Um, I don't believe in using the term minerality. And then a beautifully long, clean finish, just fabulous wine. Um, Pepe Galante made this wine because he found a place in the very upper reaches of the Yuko Valley where he said, I think we ought to be able to make the greatest Chardonnay in the world here. And if there's one thing that he brought to Argentina, it is a belief that we shouldn't just be making good wines. When he started making wine in Argentina 40 years ago, quite literally, this year is his 40th anniversary, by the way, 40th. He graduated from the university in Mendoza, and before he graduated, his professor had asked him if he wouldn't mind coming back to teach. He was that good. Uh, so he came back to teach. And uh, he still teaches. He has taught for 40 years, in addition to 
making wine and running some of the biggest wine companies in Argentina. He always goes back to teach. Um, and so he first started making wine in Argentina for Argentines. And fairly early on in his career, he had a rather, rather um, revelatory experience. He was sent to UC Davis to take a quick two-week graduate study program where he met Paul Hobbs, the American winemaker, who was working at CIMI at the time. And Paul invited him to come spend a month at CIMI making wines together. The two of them became fast friends. And of course, Pepe said, well, you have to come to Argentina. And so Paul Hobbs comes every year to Argentina. And Pepe went back to Argentina and basically said to the entire Argentine wine industry, stop, wait, you're doing everything wrong. And as you can imagine, this went over very well. <laughs> um, but in fact, he started making wines at this point for Catena. And he started making wines, and suddenly people like Robert Parker and the Wine Spectator and, and international critics started saying, you know, there's this new wine out of Argentina that's pretty good. Um, in the meantime, his students started taking over at various wineries around Argentina. And about 10 years later, which was 15, 20 years ago, you started seeing these wines begin to come into the US and on the world market, all precipitated by Pepe Galante and his students. Uh, he's now into the third generation of his students. So some of his students are now teaching. Um, and he has this wonderful comment that he says, you know, I believe the greatest wines in Argentina will be made by the people who have not yet been born. And they will learn from our mistakes, and they will make even better wines. Hard to imagine making better Chardonnay than this just about anywhere. But what do you think? Thumbs up? Yeah. Single vineyard? Yes. Yes, I will, in fact, have a whole little slide to show you the name of it. But I just didn't want it to get too warm, because if it got too warm, that would take all the fun out of it. Here is Salentine. This is where Pepe Galante now makes wine. Um, 4,900 acres on three different sites. So from about 3,500 up to about 5,500 feet in elevation. They've built the entire winery out of native stone. So even though it's a huge winery, it pretty much looks as if it's disappearing into the hillside. You can see it's not, it's not a, um, one of these, ooh, look at me wineries. And there's Pepe Galante. Uh, Paul Hobbs is a consultant, continues to work there. Um, he was the one in 97 who made the first international style Malbec. And he's now working at Bodega Salantain to make world-class wines there while still teaching at the university and uh, regularly having people come from all over the world to learn from him. A really wonderful man. Um, I've had lunches with him. I've had dinners with him. I've traveled around a bit with him. He never likes to talk about himself. When I ask about, you know, what did you bring to the industry? He always says, the only thing I brought was questions. Everyone helps with the answers. The only thing I brought was the questions. And I just think that's such a wonderfully humble way to approach redesigning an entire wine industry from top to bottom. First vineyard we're going to talk about is uh, Oasis. 3,000 to 4,000, 3,500 to 4,000 feet. Um, you can see those Andes in the background. There are, de the photograph doesn't really do it justice. You cannot believe how big those mountains are. Um, the first time I saw the Andes from this vineyard, I looked up and I said, boy, that's a big blanket cl bank of clouds up there. And then I thought, wait, those clouds are connected to the ground. Those are the Andes all the way up there. It's quite amazing. And then the second vineyard is La Pampa, a little further up, 39 to 4,200 feet. Uh, so the first wine will produce wine number, the first vineyard, Oasis, produces the third wine. We'll get to them in a minute. I'll talk you through them. The next vineyard produces the parts of the fourth wine. And then the, there is the Chardonnay. This comes from the Oasis and La Pampa's estates. So 4,000, 5,000 feet in Argentina, whole cluster pressed, French barrels, all of the usual boring stuff. 
What really doesn't come through is Pepe Galante's vision of, I think we can make world-class Chardonnay in a country that was designed to make Malbec and destined to make Malbec, okay? So that's the wine you're drinking right now. We're about to take a trip to a very, very different place. Move on to wine number two. Yes. Okay. Yep. Yep. Yeah, so it wasn't, you always hear people talk about the destemmer crusher. Yeah. This was no destemmer, it was just crusher. Yep. So, what does this wine say to you when you smell it and put it in your mouth? This is from San Juan. This is a wine grown in the desert. It's Shiraz. To me, it captures much of what is really, really nice about Australian Shiraz. It has a little more structure, a little more character. It's somewhere, and, and actually geographically it is, somewhere between Australia and the Rhone. And the wonderful thing about this, this is this is a varietal that Pepe Galante really, no one in Argentina wanted to plant Shiraz. And he said, I actually think it'll do really well in San Juan. He works with a, with a vineyard manager, Gustavo Matoc, in San Juan, who has studied at the University of Montpellier in France. So they've got a really international team working on this. And is it the greatest Shiraz you've ever had? Mm, maybe not. Is it the best Shiraz you've ever had from Argentina? Oh, yeah. And does it make you think that maybe these guys ought to play around a little bit more with Shiraz in Argentina? Absolutely. Um, it's another example how someone like Pepe keeps going and asking questions instead of just accepting what's out there. And his question was, San Juan makes a huge amount of inexpensive and not very good Malbec. Why don't we see what San Juan will make that's good quality instead of mediocre. And this was the first wine they came out with to show that San Juan had some potential to make some really, really lovely wines. Uh, this wine, whereas the first wine, I am sorry to tell you, sells for between $35 and $50 a bottle, this wine from San Juan happily comes to America for between $12 and $15 a bottle. Yeah, pretty great wine. The brand name again is Calia, and uh, from San Juan, the desert north of Mendoza. Good question, Jackie. So this is this is not under the Salentine brand. It's owned by the same company because Pepe's the winemaker here as well, or the consulting winemaker. This is not a Salentine product. It is a Calia product in the bottle. So there's the very classy, traditional Salentain label. And, and here is the much more modern Calia label from San Juan. Um, Mendoza and San Juan don't actually get along all that well. Mendoza believes that San Juan is the root of all evil. Not really, but uh, Mendoza believes that it is the Napa Valley of Argentina and it has to protect itself against unscrupulous agricultural practices in other regions. So when you drive from San Juan to Mendoza, you have to go through a checkpoint and they literally spray the underside of your car in case you're bringing any nasty hitchhikers from San Juan. I can't imagine any place in the world that, oh, wait a minute, I live in California. Uh, <laughs> we do exactly the same thing in California. We inspect every vehicle for incoming fruit and vegetables. Uh, they do the same thing when you go from San Juan to Mendoza. When you go from Mendoza to San Juan, they do not inspect your vehicle for agricultural problems, but they give you a hard time just because they can. 
They resent the fact that Mendoza does it to them on the way in, and so they're going to do it on the way out. Um, I was enormously amused when I went through the checkpoint from Mendoza to San Juan that in front of us were a group of supporters of the local regional soccer team. Mendoza was going to play in San Juan, and all of the soccer fans going through the checkpoint were be given very thorough, <laughs> very thorough inspections. Uh, thus, I think, reducing the fan population of Mendoza in the stadium by about 20%. So, yeah, that's all fair in love, war, and soccer in South America. What do you think? Good wine? Yeah. Question? This brings out characteristics of Shiraz that I've never noticed. And it's 100% Shiraz. And I think they have a chance to develop something unique from one day. That's exactly what I told Pepe when I tasted this wine the first time. I said, you know, you, everybody in Argentina starts talking about Malbec. And first thing he did for me was pour a Chardonnay and a Shiraz. And I said, okay. I'm all ears at this point because what you have here are two absolutely unique wines expressing really individual characteristics of the grape. Wow. Yeah. There's, there's more because we also get to drink some Malbec today. Minty, yeah. A little pepper to it, a little mint. Yeah, really lovely wine. Cool. Next. This is wine number three. Salantine Reserve Malbec. This is what Pepe says Malbec ought to taste like. Okay? When you think about Malbec, what are, if you're taking the Master Psalm exam, what are the, your key clues that this is Malbec? What's that? Purple, right. Color of Malbec actually has a little bit of blue in it. So it always seems a little more purple. I always joke with my students that 98% of all red wines are garnet colored, so you don't have to worry about color. Well, Malbec is the one that's not garnet color. It's a little bit purple. And then in the nose? Butter. Okay. Anybody else? Plum, blueberry. You know about the experiments by Professor Brochet, don't you? Professor Brochet, University of Bordeaux, one of my all-time heroes in terms of wine research. He gave wine experts in France, people who were official tasters for the INAO, the Institut National de whatever it is, and he gave them white wine and asked them to describe its aromas. And the white wines were described as pear and peach and melon and white flowers. And then he gave them a red wine and he said, describe the aromas of the red wine. And they were plums and blackberries and cassis, of course, because the French cassis was the same wine. He had just added red food coloring to it. <laughs> so the minute you get your purple in the color, you're going to smell plums, you're going to smell blackberries. Whether you do or not, if your eyes were closed, I don't know. Um, I will say that the winemakers I work with consistently say blueberries is one of the sort of classical notes of Malbec. Okay? And then in the mouth, we expect Malbec to be a little rounder. Certainly not as tannic as Bonarda or as Petit Verdot uh, or even as Cabernet Sauvignon and yet round, and rounder, fuller fruit than Cabernet Franc. Mm. How do you like that one? Yeah? What I, what I like about that wine so much is it goes in your mouth and you're thinking, well, it tastes just like it smells. And then there's almost in the middle of the palate, because there's the acidity, there's almost an extra little burst of there's more flavor here than you expected. And then it finishes a little bit tannic, a little bit acidic, so nicely balanced. 
frankly, at 9.30 on a Saturday morning, this isn't the wine I'd be drinking, honestly. <laughs> 8.30, right, this is more of an 8.30 wine. Um, but yesterday with um, a big chunk of beef on your plate, and of course, I don't, know if, uh, I don't know if any of you have done this, but it is absolutely worth doing sometime just for the sheer fun of it. Um, this wine isn't a perfect example of it. It works better with something like a young Barolo, a wine that when you think maybe I'll try it, it grabs your tongue and starts banging your head against the wall because it's so tannic. The ancient Romans, 2,000 years ago, used to add 2% salt water to their wines. Try taking a tiny little pinch of salt, just a few grains, and dissolving it into that Barolo and see what happens to the wine. Because what happens to the wine is that the tannin disappears. I've done this with my students, and they have then accorded me the power of a dark lord. <laughs> it absolutely changes the wine. It's quite astonishing. And I apologize for the fact that we didn't bring an asado for you today, uh, because the traditional Argentine accompaniment to this wine would be an asado. It means a huge wood fire and you just start throwing every possible chunk of meat on it, and you start eating them as they get done. So you eat the sausages first, and then the, the little bits, and then you dive into the huge chops. And two days later, you're still not hungry. <laughs> but that combination of the salt and, frankly, the fat of the meat just makes these wines seem as if they are liquid velvet. And it's well worth uh, trying that. By the way, did anyone try the chimichurri sauce last night? You liked it? Yeah. Um, does anyone know where chimichurri gets its name? Chimichurri sauce is the classic sauce of Argentina. And it is traditionally served with r the beef that they produce in the asado. It is, in, in most cases when I have had it, much less uh, creamy. It's more chunky. Chimichurri apparently came from the fact that after the English built massive railway systems in India, they were invited to Argentina to build the railway system of Argentina. And both the water system of Buenos Aires and the rail system of Argentina was built by, by English engineers. And they, in India, had learned to add chutney or curry to dishes as they ate them. And so they would ask their Argentine servants to give me curry. And the sauce that the Argentines would bring to them got to be named or nicknamed chimichurri because it was gimme curry. That's where chimichurri gets its name. If, now, here is the really good part of that story. Only one quarter of the conference is here. If you can't get a drink at the bar out of that tonight, you're doing something wrong. Okay, wine number three. Primum. It's a good sign that at 9.30 in the morning, well, it's, all, it's well past 9.30, it's 9.42. Um, I, can, I can confuse the wines already. Yes, you have a question. The last one will sell for about $30 a bottle. They get more expensive. Uh, this is Pepe Galante's best Malbec. This is the Prima Malbec. It comes, again, from Tunian, Ucu Valley from Il Portillo. Now there's a great story about the vineyard of Il Portillo because the great military general, San Martin, who liberated all of Latin America from the Spanish, the Spanish forces were primarily concentrated at this point in Chile and they felt reasonably secure because they knew that San Martin couldn't attack them because between San Martin and the, British or the Spanish troops in Chile 
were the Andes. Anyone know what Il Portillo means? The little door or the little pass. And so San Martin realized that his army was full of spies reporting back to the Spanish. These things happen in civil wars. And so San Martin announced that he would be attacking the Spanish and launching his army across Il Portillo Pass. It's a legendary part of the strategy of the, of the liberation of Latin America. And the Spanish heard this and they raced all of their troops up to defend Il Portillo. And of course, you know what he did. He took a smaller pass to the side, marched around the Spanish forces, attacked Santiago, won the battle, and freed Latin America from the Spanish occupation. So quite a famous, and so the, the, the people in Argentina, every seven or eight year old child in Argentina knows the story of Il Portillo. And once again, this is one of those stories where the Argentines would say, but you don't know about Il Portillo? And of course, none of us in America have heard this story. We have no idea what this is. So the wine that comes from the foot of the Andes up against the little pass, what do you think? Same color? Maybe even a little more intense? Yeah? And the nose, do you still get those blueberries? Licorice? Vanilla? Cola. Yep. Cool. Hmm. And even richer flavors in the mouth, even more complex. Complexity, you know, my, my wife is a professional chef, and we talk about sauces. She loves going into a restaurant and saying, hmm, now I think they put a little of this and they put a little of that. So my definition of complexity, if you taste a sauce and you say mayonnaise, ketchup, and pickle relish, that's not a sauce, that's Thousand Island dressing, and that's not complex. But if you taste a sauce and say, did they put a little mint in there? Or is it sage? Or, and maybe a little, it's probably beef stock, but there's something else in there. Maybe a little port wine. That's complexity, where you keep going back and thinking, wow, there's something else there. And for people who think that Malbec is a delicious, soft, easy to drink, relatively simple wine, exhibit A in my defense of Malbec is this wine, because this ain't simple. This is a wine that is really wonderfully rich, complex, fascinating stuff. Thanksgiving. Keeps it keeps giving. That too. Yes. <laughs> Price. Yeah. Uh, again, $40 to $50 a bottle. Yep. Hmm. I'm going to just taste this one more time because it was just too good to move on. Yummy, yummy, yummy. Um, it is not readily available. In fact, this is yet another story of Tom Wallman, to be fair. Um, when we were doing this conference, we contacted Solentane, and sa I said, I want to pour a few of your wines for this session, because it's Pepe's 40th anniversary, and I think it's appropriate he gets some credit. And they said, great, we'll, we'll take care of it. And of course, they're Argentine. So I'm sure at some point or another they would have taken care of it. Um, but about 10 days ago, I called up and I said, guys, where's the wine? Tom and Marge haven't checked it off the list. Said, oh, yeah, 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 we're going to get it, we're going to get it, we're going to get it. So they called their importer who called their distributor. Each one of these calls apparently took about two and a half days. Because finally, three, three days ago, I get a phone call, the wine, the wine is in Maryland. We can't ship it to Virginia in time for the conference because it's illegal for us to ship to the hotel. Well, couldn't you ship it to the distributor? 
well, yes, but the distributor doesn't have time to clear it and then get, so how, so as often happens in these conferences, Marge and Tom found someone to drive to Maryland and you did it? God bless you folks. How about a hand for these folks? Yeah, this is what you don't see. What you see is the swan gliding delicately through the water. What you do not see underneath the water is those legs are paddling like hell. Thank you for doing that. And what a wonderful wine, huh? Yeah, cool. Okay. We are now moving on to this is no longer Malbec. This is Pepe Galante saying, I'm not going to make the best Malbec in Argentina. That's what you just had. I'm going to make the best red wine I can possibly make in Argentina. And you'll notice it's Cabernet as well. It's Merlot. It's Petit Verdot. It's Cabernet Franc. The color is a little different. More aromatic. There's some cedar in this one that you don't get in the first one. Hmm. I, I heard the same thing happen to me. I heard it happen to about 15 other people in the room. You smelled the wine, you put it in your mouth, and the minute it hit your palate, you thought, mmm, wow, where did that come from, right? Beautiful texture to this wine. Rich, bright fruit, a little more red fruit than the pure Malbec. Pretty great, huh? About $65 a bottle. Yeah. So I always wonder about that. Yes, question in the back. Do you smell? Mole. Mole. Musty. Musty. Oh, so I bet there's a bad cork in the room. This is, yeah. Well, you know the, the way we handle this in my classes at Napa College. Each row, basically, at Napa College, we pour as an individual row. So start at this end, go to that end. And the rule is that if one of the rows gets a corky bottle, the rest of the glass turns, class turns to that group and says, that's so sad, this is the best wine we've had all year. <laughs> okay, you have a split right there. So I'm going to suggest, uh, who thinks they have a wine, uh, who thinks they have a corked bottle? Okay, because, so clearly, what I would suggest, turn to someone who doesn't have a corked bottle and treat them real nice. <laughs> See if they won't let you taste a little of their wine in the hopes of you getting, and, and Kathy, do we have... Kathy's going to go look to see if we have more five to see if we can re-pour those. Yeah, yeah, suddenly I have a whole group up front that wants more of this wine and says their glass was corked too, so. If I can ask for your attention for a minute, if you have, if you have an empty place setting, or rather a place setting where someone didn't sit, do we have any more? We had a couple over here. Is there a, a fresh glass there? There's one more glass. I'm going to go get that.
So what does the rest of the room say to the people who got the corked wine? This was the best wine. Yep. Big difference, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, yeah, sorry about the bad cork. It happens. Um, the other thing that I think is so charming about this is, you know, we often talk, I was talking to Diane about this earlier this morning, how much everyone in this group enjoys the seminars, but also how much we enjoyed not just the wines at the Bordeaux lunch, but how much we all enjoyed the opportunity for 45 minutes there to just talk to people we knew, people we didn't know, share wine, share food, and Diane and I now say, gosh, as we think about future conferences, we always take advantage of the big meals to do business meetings and all the rest. Sometimes we just need to give you the opportunity, to give ourselves the opportunity to do what brings people together, to build community around wine. This is what wine is all about. Wine, to me, is the most celebratory of all beverages. You can make beer anytime you want. You can make whiskey anytime you want. You can only make wine once. And it's exactly at that time of the year when the fruit is ripe, the vegetables are ready to eat, the animals are fat and ready to be slaughtered. It is the time when God is smiling on us or Mother Nature is smiling on us and wants to see us happy. And that's the only time you can drink wine, make wine. And when you make those wines, wines then, as we noticed last night when I was pouring that 1987 Colheita Port, wines capture not only a sense of place, these certainly capture a sense of Argentina. But wine also captures a sense of time. Wine is the only beverage we drink from the year our daughter was born, from the year that we got married. Um, it is a magical beverage in that way. And this tasting, I hope, gives you a little sense of what Pepe Galante has done in 40 years. Um, he started really making the most rustic wines in Argentina. He is now making some of the greatest wines in the world. And it is all a process through time that we can measure by drinking these wines. And as we just did in the last 10 minutes, sharing wines with it, each other because wine is one of those few pleasures in the world that actually gets better when you share it with other people. So hope you enjoyed the tasting today. Here's to you. Cheers. There's a question in the back. Um, yeah, it's, it's, a, uh, it's a vague reference to Latin. And my understanding is numina means something like um, your name or your moniker or your, your nameplate. Question. Yeah, it's an interesting question. How do grapes grown at altitude differ from grapes grown at sea level? And there is a significant difference based on UV radiation. And it's something that I've worked with in California with, for example, Lake County, which has vineyards 1,000, 1,500 feet. The UV radiation has a tendency to create thicker skins in the grapes. Now, that may or may not be a good thing, depending on whether or not your winemaker knows how to manage those. But I think it's one of the things that gives Argentine Malbec the character that it simply doesn't have in France, is the, it, you get these thicker skins, but to me, these more mature tannins, these, I mean, this wine is just, yeah, and the Chardonnay is spectacular, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs>